Okay. That was going to be good. All right. All right, so here we go. I just got a message. I'm going, I'm shutting my camera down. Oh, uh, hello, everybody. Um, glad that you could make it this afternoon uh, for the first of uh, three information uh, sessions, if you will. Um, and today we have Heather Evans Anderson from, from Department of Health Sciences and Stuart Nelson from the School of Business who have um, graciously provided, uh, taking their time to, to help us all out and give us a sense of things that they've done, strategies that they've employed uh, in their experience with online uh, teaching, remote teaching. I hope that uh, everybody can benefit from this and I would like to encourage you as well to, if you can, um, join us on Wednesday. Uh, Bill Soss and Ben Brown from Ouellette will uh, provide or be hosting a session um, covering uh, different aspects of platform utilization uh, to make the best use of different platforms. And then on Tuesday, June 30th of next week, we'll have uh, the third session that's related to this session um, <clears throat> where two faculty will, uh, again, share their experiences uh, regarding what they've learned over their time using online learning. Uh, platforms and their strategies. So with that, uh, we will begin. And if you can remember to turn off your mics if you're not uh, speaking, please. Uh, that will help us with the bandwidth. And feel free if you have questions to populate the chat room with your questions. Okay. All right. So I'm going to sign off my audio and turn it over to Stuart and Heather. Thank you, Harry. And to reiterate what uh, Harry said during his introduction, um, those of us presenting have um, um, circulated topics amongst ourselves about what we'll be covering. And we'll definitely be covering different things in each of the five sessions. So in fact, that's why I uh, asked to go first and selected the topics that I've got, which are more the overview uh, topics and how I structure my class. And then Heather is going to go into much more detail in terms of uh, various features and applications that she uses. And the folks on Wednesday and next week will be doing the same. So if you have time to go to all the sessions, um, I'm sure you're going to learn something different in each session. And uh, as Harry said, be sure to use the chat. We're monitor monitoring the chat. So, um, so that uh, Harry will interrupt us if you guys have any questions. Um, or we, you know, forget to cover something that's important to you. So feel free to speak up. So uh, as I said, mine is kind of an overview. And uh, without sharing, I just thought I could have shared a Blackboard uh, Collaborate screen so I could show you on, on share. But I'll just say it real quickly because I don't have that ready. But as I click on the middle button in the bottom, that's the share button. And when I pull up the share button, somebody asked on the survey about whiteboards. The first thing I can click on is to uh, share a whiteboard. And then I can share an application screen. I can share camera and share files. And when I share files, I'll do that typically when I'm sharing uh, either an Excel file or a PDF. But right now, I'm going to share um, application screen. Um, because I'm going to be uh, pulling up several. Uh, you're not going to see me much. What you're going to see are the, the uh, components of my course that I'm talking about. And basically, in the 15 minutes or so I have to speak, what I'm going to do is kind of tell you how I structure my course and, and give you an idea um, of how to design a course. And the way everybody was thrown into the online teaching in the spring semester, uh, you, you had to reconvert your courses over a weekend, which is not is really the worst way possible to do it. Because the first thing 
first tip that I have for those of you that are fairly new to online learning or renew in the spring is to be successful in either an online or a hybrid course. Your course needs to be designed 100% from the beginning. My goal is a week before the class starts to have everything totally done, every assignment done in Blackboard, every assignment done in McGraw-Hill Connect, my syllabus and my schedule, my detailed schedule with what everything that is due, 100% done a week before. And the reason I say a week before is especially with summer classes, but uh, the semester classes as well, I start getting emails from my students um, sometimes three weeks or a month ahead of time, they're wanting to look at course materials. Well, when I get it a month ahead of time, I just have to say I'm still teaching the current semester, so you have to wait a bit. But I try and have it done at least a week before because some students want to be looking ahead and that kind of thing. So that's um, something you couldn't do the uh, spring semester, but you can going into the fall, whether you're online or hybrid or uh, as I do for the flip classroom in my uh, intermediate finance class, I set it up similar to an online class in terms of the flip portion. So um, let me pull up. Of course, I can't find it here. And I've got the pause because I'm trying to share with you guys. And when it pulls up the share, which I did um, right before um, and successfully did it, it was very easy. And now I'm not seeing what I want to share with you. So I'm going to go to another spot um, so I don't um, so I don't waste any time. Okay, so uh, here's my blackboard, and you can see you guys have seen this hundreds of times. Uh, some numbers that I had heard um, actually a year ago from ULA is that only about 50% of faculty at that time were on blackboard. Um, which does make it very difficult for uh, students if some of their classes are in Blackboard and some aren't. So I, I know some of the work groups are talking about that uh, faculty need to have at least some component of syllabus and at least a minimum uh, number of things on Blackboard. I've used Blackboard for years because it's a, it's a great learning management system. So I'll go ahead and pull up uh, this course. And there are a couple of ways to set it up. Uh, in terms of the basic structure of your course. So the two ways that I've seen it up in terms of the big picture overview, are fo some folks set up their course week by week. And, the, and so what you'll see here on the left, and, and you can see all right, Heather, can you see my screen all right in the share? Yes, it's great. Okay, so on the left um, where you see content, the way ULA many times defaults to the shell they give you, but they don't always for me because I don't do it this way, is it's set up with week one, week two, week three, et cetera. And then within the week, you put all the readings, all the assignments, any quizzes and all that stuff within that week. So the students, one way that makes it easy for students is they, they know we're in week one, I'll just do everything in that folder. Um, the reason I have gotten away from it is when I teach in our MBA program, it's been typically seven or eight week sessions. And then in the summer, it's more like a five week session. So the weeks aren't as important because some of my assignments, I may have two assignments due or an assignment due every three quarters of a week or that kind of thing. So I do it uh, within a content folder. And once students get used to my system, um, they, uh, you know, they, they can pretty much get with the, uh, the program. So showing you when they click content, they know they can click content for almost everything within the course. So the first thing I do is uh, prior to the course is I schedule an intro video. And this video is about 30 minutes. They click on this and they will get a video where I explain the whole structure and the content of the course, uh, what all the assignments, um, are expected of them, all the expectations for the course, 
and um, just how to be successful in the course. And I stress to them in multiple emails, you can even see from the note I have here, that you got to watch this. And what I find is I can tell, in fact, I'm doing statistics tracking so I can see who watches it and who doesn't. The ones that don't watch it, I get tons of emails. And um, and that's even more true with undergrads than the MBAs is they think they can wing it. You know, the types of students that think they can get through a course without buying the book and then brag to their friends they do that. And, you know, they're just making it harder on themselves. So I have the intro video, which really helps. Uh, I post my syllabus. And within the syllabus, um, I have the course schedule, but I provided another link for the course schedule to make it uh, easier for the students to see. And actually, this is what I was trying to pull up as a PDF, so that's why I thought I'll just pull up my Blackboard. Now, Heather, can you still see this? I want to keep checking that I'm not talking into thin air. Yep, it's great. I'll let you know if it's not. Okay, so um, this course schedule, uh, you can see the way I've set it up. And I set it up week by week. So rather than weak folders, they can look at this, and this becomes their Bible in terms of knowing what to do, what chapters we're covering. Um, I have homework. Well, in this class, I have homeworks that aren't taken up, um, and then uh, quizzes. Uh, I tell them what problems are assigned. You can see the other two yellow blocks are the midterm and final exams. And, um, and then I have, in the summer class, I just have one big assignment due that they do outside on their own and turn in through a Blackboard link. Um, if a regular semester course, I'd have multiples. But I just put it in one big assignment, and they work on it through the whole summer term. Um, one thing you'll see is I have, the reason I don't do it by weeks, you can see um, for this summer class, the quiz open close dates, they're like five days in between each one. And I tried to make them all close consistently on Friday so that students didn't, um, you know, didn't forget when the dates were, um, so they keep that in mind. But the other thing to point out that I had uh, at least two students this semester out of 30 that um, periodically on the quiz dates when they closed, uh, the next day I get an email that, uh, oh my God, I've been trying to stay right on top of the schedule and I got busy with something else at work and I realized the quiz was due last night. And I make all my assignments due at midnight. So when you're online, um, you know, to me, that's an advantage for everyone. The students don't have to remember that something to do at three in the afternoon or whatever. If everybody knows to do it at 11.59 on that night, you set it up that way, then it's, then they don't have to remember those details between my class and your class and somebody else's class that have various due dates. So, with the students that say, oh my gosh, I missed the assignment. Well, I also have in my syllabus that um, I will allow them to have late assignments at 50% credit. You make 100% on that assignment and you get 50% credit. And that, that's that been a lifesaver for a few students. And when I go back and, I, you know, before I tell them, you know, they, it's in their syllabus. They should see it anyway. But uh, when I go back to, um, you know, tell them what the situation is, I do kind of glance at how their grades are. And these are students that are doing real well. You know, these are even A students um, that have that situation. So um, just in terms of, um, you know, something that has worked for me on, in terms of online classes, that makes up for this. They get sidetracked on other things and allows them to not totally lose all their points for that assignment they missed. So in terms of the software I use, um, Blackboard, as you can see, I do a lot with Blackboard. Um, I use uh, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra for any synchronous classes. I use McGraw-Hill Connect um, for, um, for their quizzes, homeworks, quizzes, and, um, and exams, which is real nice. Cengage also has similar materials if you don't use a McGraw Hill text. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, there's a huge debate on recording, what to use for recording classes um, to, to put online for students. Um, and I use Camtasia, and I, I learned about Camtasia a couple of years ago from another faculty member, mm -hmm. and it has a lot more, um, a lot more resources. It allows you to edit, uh, it allows you to clip together uh, different videos, so I can record an intro video on my iPhone and then send it to my computer and connect that with the video 
that um, that I've recorded on the lecture, that kind of thing. So the problem is I have to pay for Camtasia myself. So if we get enough people using it, perhaps we can get the university to do a site license, but it's about $150. But I use Collaborate Ultra for um, a number of my uh, for for my synchronous classes. So I'm hearing a lot of beeping there. Is there are there questions, Heather or, or Harry, that I should be answering right now? Um, I was answering them on the in oh, the okay. chat. And he was just okay. asking what Camtasia okay. was, and uh, Will was uh, asking or saying that Pearson also has an online homework system. Oh, okay, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, so then. Um, my online classes vary because the online MBA classes have gone from required synchronous once a week classes for two or three hours to being online totally. So I have to have the intro video for that. But I would use Collaborate Ultra for the online synchronous classes prior, uh, prior to that when we uh, were required to have the synchronous sessions at a t class time that was on the course schedule that you could look up. But if you look at the other things, I've got Connect links here. Um, McGraw-Hill has uh, Learn Smarts in Connect, which are, um, it, it's a way of reading through the chapters and there are st uh, different um, checkpoints within the chapter where it asks questions, you work problems, you do little quizzes and that kind of thing. So it is, ensures they learn. Um, I also have a recording. So if I would have had a synchronous class, I'd put the recordings in this folder each week. And I usually get still about 90% attendance at the live classes because the students like to ask questions. But um, now that um, this particular class has gone totally online, um, I've recorded a video for every chapter here. So you can see that uh, I have these recordings for each chapter. Uh, basically, what I do is about two or three weeks before the class starts, I'll, um, each, each recording is about an hour. And so I'll spend half a day on each recording and try and get them done in one week because I'm kind of in the mode of doing videos. But however you guys do it, you know, everybody's got their own way of doing it. And then uh, also being this is a numerical course, I, I try and give them um, some help in terms of how I work the problem. So, you know, I, I have them do everything in Excel, so I give them some uh, material in terms of how I work the problem. So I post those as well. Um, and then the quizzes, I have links here. These all links, when I click these links, they go to McGraw-Hill Connect so that they have all that here within their Blackboard. The Excel assignment, the assignment is here where they find it, and then they turn in the assignment through the same link. And being that I have about, like I said, about 30 students in this class, when a student emails their assignment, I ask them to go back and turn it in on the link because the last thing I need to do is keep track of 30 emails and find out two students I can't find their assignment because they turned them in earlier, that kind of thing. Uh, I have PowerPoint slides. They're narrated slides on every chapter and, uh, and then some other materials. So I am going to, so as I click tabs, Heather, can you see the new tab or is this, uh, did it go away? So McGill Connect. Yeah, you need to switch. Okay. So, so let me stop sharing and share again. Uh, there we go. Okay, so in McGraw Hill Connect, um, when you click those links, and I actually uh, move this over to uh, my undergrad course because I have a few more materials in there, but I mentioned the Learn Smart, so you can see I use the Learn Smarts for every chapter to help the students go through the chapter. And I've gone back and forth to requiring them for points, but I found that it works even much better. I give just a couple of points extra credit when they complete those. Um, there are quizzes on every chapter, so you have to create each quiz based on the test bank or the homework problems they have. I have homeworks on every chapter and uh, the midterm and final exam I create there as well. And the other thing with McGraw-Hill uh, Connect is it's, it's real nice in terms of assessing the performance. So I can go through and assess every question, how many students missed each question, 
um, and look at them individually as well. Um, the other thing I found in terms of uh, my synchronous classes is that um, with synchronous, it was a lot of class discussion, which I think we all hope to to have um, as much class discussion as possible. Let's see, there we go. I, I, I'm not sure now, I hope. So um, what I found is over the years, students have uh, become much more tech savvy. And now what I'm finding more and more is that students want to text responses to discussion more than uh, voice. And when you have a larger class, um, like I said, about 30 students or so, um, and the text works a lot easier. I get even more interaction that way. So I've started allowing that. And the other thing that I started doing, that gave me the idea of my face-to-face FSIM class last fall. Uh, I had a number of students who were super shy and didn't want to speak up. I'd call on them and they'd speak. But, you know, we'd have a really good discussion going and a handful wouldn't speak. And this class is on prejudice and discrimination. So I like everybody to be involved. So what I did is I brought up Blackboard discussion and so I started a discussion thread, put it on the screen in the front of the classroom, told every student to log in. Um, I'd ask them a question that I wanted feedback in. And I, I was getting 99% participation from my students. In fact, I'd even wait a second or two and I'd, you know, I'd say, Harry, you know, you didn't, um, you didn't um, respond to that question. What do you think? And because Harry didn't want to speak up in class, but Harry was okay typing a text answer. I was getting great discussion, even though you know it wasn't verbal discussion, but we were all reading them. I was getting a lot of comments in class based on the discussion from students typing in. So um, you know, the, the discussion in any kind of seems to work really well. The other thing I want to mention, I, I don't know, I haven't been watching time. Heather, am I running out of time here? You're at 2.20. So, okay. so um, I think I am. Around two, or okay. two so um, one thing I want to mention is academic honesty. And we have Respondus that works in Blackboard, um, as well as Respondus Lockdown. And if you Google that um, in on YouTube, you can find 50 different ways to bypass Respondus and Lockdown and record looping videos. So we, the camera's supposed to be watching you. It's watching a looping video. And so those things aren't perfect. Um, McGraw-Hill has come up with Proctorio that is like Respondus for Connect, if you want that as well. But what I found in terms of my advice and the advice I've given to finance faculty is give a time limit on an exam have enough questions on an exam that they really have to know their material to get through it, ask questions that are higher on the Bloom's taxonomy so that students can't just Google definitions and that kind of thing. And you know, if the grading is a little lower than I'd like, I can always curve it upwards. But if I have every student in the class making 95 or better, um, there's no way to undo that. So for me, that's been one way around um, you know, kind of to deal with the academic dishonesty. So being that I, I think I talked way too long, I'll hand it off to Heather. So, thank you. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Um, I, I want to pause here before um, I kind of dive in um, and see if there's other things that, um, based on the, the um, survey that we did, there were specific questions that y'all wanted addressed. Is there anyone in the participants now um, that has a specific thing that you would like me to address um, before we kind of dive in? I was planning like Stuart to kind of guide you through what I do in my class and um, go from there, but I'm happy to make adjustments to what exactly you came here today for. So we'll ask, is there any way to have a safe testing center? I'm not sure I know what that is. I wonder if they mean like the proctored? Yeah. Where pay a little extra and, and they're even in uh, that proctorio, they have a proctored version, but you have to pay so much per student for that. Yeah, I gave my, um, so I, our, and 
anatomy and physiology, we have a, a, a national exam that we can administer. And so I um, was able to administer that last spring, though, um, in a computer lab um, based using their um, software. Um, so I think it's possible to have that. But, you know, again, with the social distancing requirements that we have, I think that that's going to be kind of tough to have students come in to take a test somewhere. So. Okay, so with that, I'm going to um, share with you um, the screen um, for my Blackboard course. It looks kind of like what um, Stuart did. Okay, so um, his course was more uh, sophisticatedly laid out, I think, than mine. I don't do much other than just load it from um, semester to semester. Um, and I will preface this with I don't teach a purely online course. Uh, I use a lot of online components in my course just because I have found that it helps me manage my courses more effectively. Um, so uh, in my content, like Stuart, that's where I kind of lay everything in there. Um, I have a welcome letter for students, a syllabus. Um, something that I really stick to is the learning objectives. Um, for my course, and that's how I kind of construct all the ass assessments and everything that my course is built around. Um, so everything is in here for the students to see, all their assignments, the lab stuff, their lecture slides, um, and all the, the things that they need to do, the links to take their exams, all these things, um, which I'm sure you all know how to do. Um, but the things that I want to point out that I think um, I do that has really changed things for me is that um, I link out to my uh, Connect course, like Stuart. I also use Connect and rely on it heavily for quizzes, um, learn smart assignments, and um, even exams is how I delivered my online exams in the spring and how I intend to uh, administer them for the fall is through Connect. Um, Something that I use for co connection with the students is on the um, announcements page. And so in my announcements, um, and you can kind of scroll through, this is a running tally of all of the um, my communications with the class. And so when I go to make an, an announcement, I um, I knew ears when they were taking their exam and the thing was broken and so I was trying to fix it. Anyways, um, I uh, communicate with the class using the announcement feature. And with each announcement, I create it and then it sends an email to the class. And what I find most helpful is that um, I have a running tally of all of those announcements. And so a student can't have the excuse, well, they missed something, they missed an email because it's always here and embedded in their course where everything else is. Um, so I found that kind of life changing for the um, communication with the course. I also use Remind Me, which was um, a way that students could get announcements via text, um, very short, brief announcements. Um, some students subscribe, some students said if they wanted text um, announcements, they subscribe to it. Um, it was a bit of a pain for me because I was doing it in two places, and so I probably won't do it again moving forward. Um, some other things that I wanted to um, show you and talk specifically about today um, is about course structure and um, your syllabus and kind of weighing your assignments based on uh, those things. So I'm going to actually, I'll download this and then open it um, in a different file so that you can see it more clearly. So this is my syllabus, and it is a very, um, 
it's very long <laughs> syllabus, but I put a lot of stuff in here. Um, I put, I have a spy, so I put all of that information in here. I put a lot of teaching philosophy tips in here um, for students, so I give you all this to go through. But what I wanted to get to is here with the breakdown of the course structure and how I intend to change that um, moving forward um, in the hybrid age <laughs> that we, I think we're moving into. Um, but this is my basic uh, breakdown of how their grades are determined. They have three exams, a cumulative final, quizzes that they're, I give them via Connect, um, and these Learn Smart assignments. Um, I also have a participation attendance grade. Um, this is probably where I'm going to give the most uh, change moving forward um, online. Um, and I also have lab quizzes um, that will likely change, too, depending on how lab get structured in the fall once we get our um, final guidelines, I guess. So um, here, um, some things that I think really have helped in, in the online um, delivery is that I really rely heavily on these um, quizzes and the, the Learn Smart assignments, which you can very easily do, and even if you don't use Connect, you can use them um, in Blackboard, designing simple little uh, quizzes or um, even polls that you can give points to. Um, I use Poll Everywhere um, while I'm delivering my classes as my survey tool, but you could use Socrative, Kahoot, whatever it is. Um, I just like Poll Everywhere because that's, um, it delivers the most different kinds of questions. Um, so anyways, this, uh, these kinds of things and how to structure these, and so I'll probably change how these points are distributed, giving more weight to this attendance and participation um, to the online to try to encourage students to be online uh, more uh, often in the in the future. And like Stuart, um, in his layout, I have a lot of Q&A, frequently asked questions built into my syllabus, and I also have a running discussion board on Blackboard where I list those questions. Um, but going down, like Stuart, I have these uh, very detailed uh, calendar um, for what we're doing as we're moving through the course, where the quizzes would be due, um, and the um, exams, uh, the labs, all of the different assignments are laid out that way. And I think that that kind of helps students uh, guide them through. And you can build this all into Blackboard as well. Um, okay, so some other things that I um, will should I pause? And is there any questions that came up? No, just comments so far. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, yes, Missy, I use a virtual rat for um, endocrine system. It's kind of fun. Um, so uh, the other things um, that I kind of wanted to just uh, briefly talk about would be um, how my communication strategies with students. So I use the announcements in Blackboard. Uh, like I already mentioned, and I uh, use uh, SSC campaigns sometimes, not just for advising, but also for my class. So um, if I wanted to schedule, like if I wanted to set up individual appointments with students, I could do that via SSC, which is kind of nice. Um, you can pull your class rosters through SSC, and that will send text reminders to students for when their appointments are. I also use Calendly, um, which links to my calendar and allows students to set up appointments with me. And when I did that in the spring, um, instead of the students showing up at my office, I sent them a link and they joined me on Blackboard Collaborate session. Um, the um, active things, because I do like to do um, as much active learning in the classroom as possible, and some things that I can help convert my um, active learning experiences that I do in lecture or in the classroom to the online format. So um, lots of times I'll have students work on questions um, in class and then report out, kind of like a think, pair, share, but between a group. Um, so instead of doing that, I would have them do it on a Google Doc or um, a Google Slide, um, and then that group would follow that link and then share it out with the class by providing the link to the work that they had done on the document or on the slide, like 
think of an image um, where they're trying to put things together in a pathway. In physiology, there's a lot of that. So um, the students can work together on the slide and then collaboratively, no matter where they are in the classroom or outside of the classroom, and then share that back out with the group. Um, I also have been thinking about having students make Quizlets. I know a lot of students like Quizlet, um, but to try to make it a little bit more thoughtful is to have the students make the Quizlet not from their own study guides, but also that they would share out with the class. And so that may be something that I would imagine a student who, if they didn't participate um, synchronously with the rest of the class, you could have them make a Quizlet and then share it out with the class and have the other students like evaluate it or you as a professor evaluate it. Quizlets um, share just like Google Docs. Um, it's just via a link. They don't have to sign up for something separate. Um, I've already mentioned Pull Everywhere, um, and that's something that I use a lot. Pull Everywhere has a lot of different versions of types of questions that you could ask, and so um, you can send out surveys um, easily through Pull Everywhere and get a response um, from students, even open-ended questions in Pull Everywhere. So I really like those. Um, some other things that, um, in terms of um, developing assessments. So in the quizzes that I mentioned um, that I run through Connect, but you could run them through Blackboard and adjust the settings in the same way. Um, I give quizzes at the end of each section. Um, in these quizzes, I let the students take um, twice. So they have two attempts. Um, they do have a defined due date, but like Stuart mentioned, you know, <laughs> students are always asking for extensions on quizzes or if they missed. Um, I assign more than I count, so if they miss one, um, they're not going to be in trouble, but if they miss more than that, then they can get behind really quickly. Um, but I like, having the, I like having the two attempts, so if the student wants to improve their grade, they can go on the second attempt and improve um, if they wanted something more on the, the quiz. I've also um, changed the way that I ask questions on exams. Um, so instead of just asking a true, false, or multiple choice question as I would in an in-class on paper exam, I instead ask the student to explain their answer in one or two sentences. Um, and that really changed my um, exam grades that from that first online exam that I gave in the spring versus the third one. Um, it really changed a lot asking the students to write out some of those answers. Um, just really brief explanation. I felt like that really helped them dig out a little bit more material. Also, the um, graphs, so in the sciences, or visual cues, um, I had them, I, I put a picture up and I had them uh, explain what the labels are or ask questions about the labels, which is something, those kinds of questions, they wouldn't be able to Google the answers for. I also randomized the questions. Um, while they're taking it, and like Stuart said, uh, I put a time limit on the test to help reduce the amount of time that they had to look up the answers. But I'm going, I build the test on the assumption that they are, um, have their materials in front of them and that they are using them as a reference. I just don't give them enough time to really reference, uh, to really look up a lot of those references. Some other things, um, I had them, I, I like to use essay questions, and so I had them physically write out the answers to their essay questions. Again, this was a lesson learned when I had them type it into a text box. Their answers, there was a lot of copying and pasting. There was a lot of shared answers there. So instead, I had them write out their answers and then scan it with their phones using an app called Cam Scanner, which was really easy. Then they uploaded that to Blackboard so that I could see their written answers. Um, and that really helped alleviate some of the sharing of answers there. Um, so, I mean, I could go on and talk about that, but I'd like to switch gears Heather, and leave the last. Heather, Heather yep. you got a question on what is a cam scanner? Cam, cam scanner is an app um, that is basically like they just take a picture with their phone or some device and it turns that picture into a PDF. I like cam, there's lots of apps that they um, can use to do that, but I like Cam Scanner because it optimizes the contrast ratio. And for my aging eyes, um, it really helps me read their um, 
their um, answers. And so, um, Harry, uh, you asked about Socrative. Um, Socrative is great, um, and yes, it can be used as quizzes. Um, any of these things can. You can have the students um, identify themselves and sign up with their names, and then you could use that as a grade. Um, again, I like Poll Everywhere because I it has a, a bunch of different question types. Um, and so in anatomy and physiology, sometimes I'll ask them to label a picture, sometimes I'll ask them to fill in the blank, sometimes I'll ask them a multiple choice. And so it just gives me different formats that I really like. Um, and I can reuse them. <laughs> sometimes in Socrative or Kahoot, you have to um, retype them. So are there other, um, any other questions that are people, or specific things that people want to talk about? Stuart mentions Kahoot. Um, Kahoot is also really great. However, um, myself included, when I have done Kahoot, I don't like the timing of the questions where I, I get that it can move can move students along. Um, the timing really stresses me out, um, and I, I suspect it does some students too. I'm, just, I'm also not a competitive person, so some students are all about that competitive. They want to win, um, but I am not like that. So, uh, but Kahoot is also really great structure. And yes, uh, Harry, I, I, I've got the list of all these different things that I've mentioned, and um, I'll send you the list. Um, yes, Tara, Poll Everywhere is the one that I use. Um, so if there um, aren't any other questions, I can show you how the Blackboard recordings kind of went, maybe. That'd be good since there seemed to be some discussion Blackboard versus Zoom. So I'll take you back into my um, Blackboard course and go down to uh, Collaborate Ultra. Um, so I think while there are lots of benefits to having Zoom. I actually prefer Zoom myself, um, but I do see the benefit of having these um, recordings um, based within your Blackboard course so students have a one-stop shop for everything that they um, need to link out to. And so here is um, where these sessions are recorded, and so um, these uh, sessions so you could go ahead and schedule a session and so these are scheduled sessions that we offered here um, you could also use the course room I used this a lot when I was meeting with students and so if they emailed me and had a question I said go into the course room they would meet me in there um, I think if I click on this it'll take you out but you guys know what this looks like I think if you played around with it um, or I could share this link if you can see that the guest link is how I'd send the student a response and say meet me in the course room here's the link um, to join and so we did a lot of answering questions in the the course room or meeting up and students even met up as groups within the course room where they could share their own screens and talk to each other um, as they were studying for their exams under the recordings um, this is where, let's go back to when it all fell apart <laughs> in March. Um, uh, here you can see all the recordings of all the sessions that we did. And so again, I do see benefit in the students having all of these um, recordings in one place um, built into their course, their Blackboard course. Um, and so like you could see, for example, this would be um, a recording of a quick um, answer that I did or a recording um, of specific things like a review of questions from their quizzes or here is one of my lectures. Um, so all of these were kind of embedded in to um, their recordings and so students could go in and click um, and watch I think it's going to yeah it switches to a different screen to watch it 
Um, but if you're interested in talking about those um, specific recordings, I'd be happy to do that with you. But the, um, I think the benefit of having them all in one place, my spy even um, recorded sessions um, and put them in here. And she did it by going into the, um, the course room and just hitting record. And then that would uh, allow for her to post a recording of the session. So I found that really helpful and the students really enjoyed that as well. Um, so, um, yes, uh, Lisa, you ask about breakout rooms and Blackboard Collaborate. You can do breakout rooms, um, and I haven't really utilized those a whole lot, um, but I intend to if we are, if I'm doing this online, um, breaking it out. Uh, Mike. Is, it does that really well. <laughs> Mike Eskenazi, and he's going to talk about that next week. Um, uh, talking about the recording um, in Blackboard, I'll go back and I'll show you how simple it is. So if you enter the course room and join the course room, here I'll switch what my, I'm sharing so you can see what that looks like. Okay, so um, if you get, yeah, you can see my course room now, and so all you do is go up and start recording to uh, start the recording, and then when you're done, you stop recording, and then it automatically loads up into um, your Blackboard course, like I showed you. Um, and so there's a benefit to that where you're not downloading a separate. Um, video file and then uploading it. However, if you have videos recorded somewhere else and would like to upload it, you could also upload them there too if you're not doing the recording in Zoom. So if you were, sorry, if you were doing the recording in Zoom, had that file, then you could upload that into your Blackboard course. But I, that would be a little, you know, just some extra steps to have to take that may make it a little more complicated. Um, but the, the, the way that you would do breakout groups would be under the, the share content. Um, so here, if you open the Collaborate panel, which is weird because I'm like in a Collaborate panel within a Collaborate panel, but um, this share content here would be where you can go through. And you can even do simple polls within your Blackboard and those that remain in the recording um, or set up breakout groups. Um, here within the share content. So there's been um, lots of questions too, I think, about um, using the, the whiteboard. So Kirsten just mentioned the whiteboard. Um, the, um, the whiteboard within Blackboard is great. Um, I typically just add a blank white scratch slide within my PowerPoint presentation and use that as the, the whiteboard so it's recorded along with the other course materials. Um, but, you know, everybody's got their own kind of um, way that they do it. Um, and so I, I found that I, I use a, um, you can write on it, Missy, I use a graphics pad. Um, which is for less than $50, you can get a graphics pad, it has a, like a stylus on it, and um, I use that to write on the slides as if you're writing on the whiteboard in class, and it records along with the, the session. Um, yeah, chat, the Wacom tablet, Wacom, Huon, Intuos, all of those are really great. If you want, I'd be happy to go through that with any of you. I'm showing you, you know, how I set that up um, and do it. I can even show you an example of how it's done in my class. If you'll give me a second to pull that up.
<laughs> yeah, drawing with the mouse, I don't know why you would want to do that. Um, it's taking a while to load the, the recording. Let me see if I can share it. Share. Okay, so um, this is a, a recording of one of the lectures I gave towards the end. Um, okay, so uh, we're that's awkward. So, <laughs> anyways, I'm going to skip forward to here would be a point where, um, and my handwriting is super messy on this slide, but um, here is a point where I've written on the slide on the picture as I'm using it, as, as I'm talking about it and annotating it at the same time in the recording. And so students have really liked this because they can go back and watch um, the recording over and over again, and, and it's uh, possible for them to um, kind of review the material more deeply. So um, it's it works out great. Um, the uh, and Tommy, your comment about the chemical formulas, drawing it out, um, it it works really well with the graphics pad, and much better than the mouse. <laughs> um, you can even type things out, like if you're using symbols or equations, um, you could type those out, um, and then also add your annotations around them. So I think that that. Um, works out quite well, and the students have really enjoyed the um, recordings of those. Yes, uh, Harry, anything like if you're complex. And so if you've ever seen a Khan Academy video um, explaining things, then um, that's, it, it, it does. Um, so, Kristen, you asked, how is the, PowerPoint playing while you're typing on it or writing on it? Um, I'm not sure, Kristen, I understand what your question is. So it just, um, here, I can. The, the collecting dot. <laughs> um, and remember, <laughs> so, uh, here, remember that the um, tubule the two, the renal papilla, which is the tip of the renal pituitary. I don't know how to do that on here. <laughs> I should be happy to show you if you want more questions. I've got a lot of screens up here. I'm a little flustered um, trying to get it going. But um, the the slides um, are, you know, I, I open up PowerPoint as if I am uh, in the at the podium and I'm writing on it and everything that's on my screen is recorded um, in the for the blackboard recording um, and so I'd be happy to do that more elegantly <laughs> on a one-on-one -on -one, or if there's a couple of you that want to do that with me then I'd, I'd be happy to go through that with you so we've got like 10 minutes left, I think, for this session. Um, or do you guys want to open this up for like a conversation? If there's other things that you want to talk about? Again, um, like Stuart mentioned um, earlier, we there each session, everyone's going to talk about something a little different. So I do encourage you to, to go to the other sessions um, uh, this week and next. Um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to get the most out of it. Um, so, Missy, you asked, so you can use the, the tablet whiteboard sort of as, as a smart board? Yes, um, that is the, the case. Um, I don't have a tablet. I've just been running everything through my laptop. Um, so, uh, that, but like if people have an iPad, they've used it for the same way. Um, I, again, I like to keep it all within Blackboard just because I'm not switching because you can see I just get flustered when I'm going from one thing to the next. And so I try to keep everything in one place. And you don't have to have a laptop or it can be a computer um, is the, the best way. Um, all you need to be able to open is Blackboard and uh, PowerPoint at the same time and to share your application of PowerPoint 
um, into your Blackboard recording. Um, and the the um, the graphics tablet, so I have it sitting next to me, it's just a, a USB connection. So you would need a USB connection. Um, but if you have a touch screen um, tablet or laptop, then you can use that as your graphics pad. It's just, I, th I feel like the, the graphics pad gives you more detail in your writing. Um, uh, like you were saying, how it's difficult to write with a mouse. I find it really difficult to write on some touchscreen surfaces. I like the, the graphics pack because it gives you the detail as if you were writing on a piece of paper. Um, yes, Kirsten. Uh, I, I, when I open the PowerPoint um, and I just put a blank slide, then I can write on it. I write on the slide. And Wacom, uh, the Wacom tablets or any kind of graphics pad is a USB connection. Some are Bluetooth connection. Um, so I even had one when I taught in a really large lecture um, at my previous institution. I had one that I could walk around with and write on, and then it would project onto the screen. Um, I forget the name of what that was, but I, I think it was also a Wacom, but it was like a, it had a Bluetooth connection. Um, so, does he ask, uh, he opened the PowerPoint and whiteboard? No, I'm, I'm just opening the, the PowerPoint um, in PowerPoint, like the, the slide presentation. And I, I put a blank slide in and use that as the whiteboard. Or I write on top of each slide. Um, on top of the, the the graphics or whatever's embedded on the slide. So, and again, happy to to go through that. So, are there's other any other things? So, um, the next session, Bill South is going to lead, and he is a Blackboard expert and online class. He actually teaches online. Um, so um, he'll lead that session, I believe, is, Harry, is that on Wednesday? Um, and then next week, next Tuesday, I believe, is when Mike Eskenazi is going to be talking, and he'll give uh, more detail about the breakout rooms. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, Missy, uh, feel free to reach out. I, I'd be happy to, to go through it with you or um, anytime. Any more questions or should we sign off? People are signing off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yep, yeah, I think we're good. Okay, thank you. Harry, I'm jumping to another meeting, so I'm going to get off pretty quickly too.